Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this dressage talk number 21. I'm impressed that in this pandemic, we're already doing our 21st edition. And this time, we have a wonderful guest, and that is Hilde Gurney. Many of you know her a lot, but I just, I have to tell you that when I, when I, when I started competing internationally, Hilda Gurney was like the name in the Americas. And I've, and I've been always like fascinated by her way of riding. And she's a true horsewoman, wonderful person. Nowadays, we've been colleagues, we've judged together in Canada. I remember she's a wonderful person. She has competed internationally. She has done many horses. She has trained many horses, many riders. She's also a breeder. And I'm just delighted that we have Hilda with us today. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation, Hilda. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to meet everyone. Well, great. We, when, when we were planning this uh, conference, we, de we decided that we were going to talk about how dressage has changed. And not only by dressage, we mean training, competitions, judging. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And of course, as any other day, you can ask questions through the chat and I will ask the questions with Hilda. So Hilda, one, one question. Did you come from a family of riders or this was one of your ideas when you were young? When did you start it and how did that happen? Uh, my family is flyers. My father uh, barnstormed with Charles Lindbergh, and um, he flew then for United for the rest of his life. And both my brothers were pilots. One was an uh, Air Force pilot. And um, I was always one that my father would take the two boys to the airport and take them up flying and left me let me on the, stay on the bench because I was a girl. So I just automatically fell in love with horses. I think I was born in love with horses. And as soon as I could, with my babysitting money, buy a horse, I bought a horse. And our neighbors, we were in the country then, we had the hunt coming through our fields. Now it's all city, but, and um, I'd watch the hunt come through. And then, so I started writing English and gradually went into eventing and um, started training horses through college. Still an amateur, but I trained for board. And, you know, and then I rode my first, Olymp I rode eventing first. I had a wonderful little thoroughbred flag self I bought for $350. And uh, it's a four-year-old. And I, with him, I won both the intermediate event championship for the United States and the advanced event championship for the United States. And we got three tenths of Colonel Podoski and Artrasaj test. Both extended canters and a halt salute. And that, then I uh, went to the Olympics in 68, way back when, for anybody else who was born. And I watched the top riders, Harry Bolt and Neckerman, and uh, uh, really saw that lovely horse, Papo, Papel, I think he's, I don't know how to pronounce it, Russian horse, and the types of horses they used. And so then I went horse shopping, okay. and I found King in a pasture with some cows. He, they tried to race him, he used to throw bread, and he couldn't fit in starting gate. And he was three, and so I bought him, and uh, by then I was already doing a lot of dressage because when I did the, the vetting, I won the dressage part of the events and was very interested in dressage and um, had already hauled my horses. No dressage in California at that time, except for Kira Dalton. And she rode in the Olympics in 68 and I watched her and I would drive up just to watch her train her horse. I would drive up to uh, San Mateo, which is Northern California. I would leave on a Saturday morning at five o'clock in the morning and then watch a trainer horses at 10. She even let me sit on cadet or an empty horse and do ones. And then um, wasn't anybody in California teaching at that time. So I trailered my horses three times actually 
uh, over to the East Coast and worked at the American Dressage Institute, which was in Saratoga Springs, New York. I got really good at driving horse trips. Okay. And um, so went on to there and started competing King Grand Prix and uh, he, the Germans really liked him and everybody said he was a good horse. And it went on from there with him because he was amazing. And that's okay. sort of where I came. And well, just from what you just said, I, had a, I have a lot of questions. The, my, my, my first question would be, I, I would say in your time and in my time, we all started jumping or doing some other things. Now kids have the opportunity, or I'm not sure if it is good or bad, of being concentrated on dressage since they're very small. What, what do you think about it? Do you think it's good? Do you think it puts too much pressure? What, what are your thoughts about that? I have a lot of thoughts about it because I do a lot of teaching. I, I, I average teaching at least 12 lessons a day and I teach every age. But when the children start younger in dressage, maybe not only dressage, but some dressage, they always sit a little more supply than children who don't. I came from a vending and I was a pretty stiff rider and I still am. And, um, and I work very hard not to be. But the children that do dressage while their bodies are forming, just like any other sport, most sports children are pretty much into their sport by 10 years of age. If you look at any of the other sports, whether it's swimming or hockey or whatever. Um, but I think they're better, will be a better dressage sitting rider if they start when they're young, some dressage. But I think the riders who only do dressage don't have the feel of the wind going through their air, like through their hair, like uh, riders that do dressage always. And I think it's a little bit that they do, do both. You know, I think that really helps to do both. Okay. And then you mentioned your first Olympics were in 1968. How would you compare the stage uh, of this? Sorry? Well, the ones I watched in 68. I didn't ride in 68. Okay. The one then, I watched. Them. Yes, I know. But then how would you compare dressage there as to dressage now? Because many times you see on the media, in Facebook, or in different newspapers, some people arguing that the past was always better because there was more classical dressage, lighter riders, lighter horses. What, what would you say about that critic that we hear many times? Is it getting better or getting worse or what? Oh, it's, it's so much better. It's better and better and better, the quality. And um, now than it was then. I mean, then you never saw a horse pee off. <laughs> None of them pee off. I mean, and the harmony we have now is just tremendous. And the horses we have now, there's no comparison to the horses we had 50 years ago. Yeah. They're so much better now. Yeah, I totally it's, agree. And I think you, the breeders, have done an amazing job. Uh, of course, there are some little things here and there that some of the experts criticize but no one can deny that you know the movements the quality the conformation of the horses today compared to 40 50 years ago is totally different i many times i just wonder what the old masters could have done if they would have had those horses well they rode differently then um, most of the horses in, when I was in the 60s and 70s, and I went, I rode in the Olympics in 76, um, most of them were not as hot. And Keen was incredibly hot. I mean, unbelievably hot. But most of the horses were not as hot. And so it was a lot of heavy riding, heavy, strong riding. It's like the men were predominant riders by far and the horses they rode pretty much could only be ridden by a man or a very very strong woman and it was a whole different sort of riding than now where we have women riding the horses and we have hot horses and 
that take tactful riding, but they give you everything they got. And um, it's just a different kind of horse and a different kind of riding. And the horses we have now are hot, they're sensitive, they're willing, they're capable. And you, it's not a strength game at all. It's more tact, tact on the part of the rider and the ability to be able to sit the incredible gates the horses have and keep them in balance with their huge gates. So it's, it's quite a bit different. Okay, for everybody's information, that was Keen, the horse that Hilda was just talking about. Uh, so Hilda, then let's go back to this East and West Coast in the U.S. How do you think that has evolved over the years? Uh, at some point, I think the West Coast was, was very, very strong. Uh, what do you think about that? No. Um, all the actions in the East Coast. So if you really want to make the team, even when I made the team in 1975 for the first time, you had to go to the East Coast. The selection trials were at Gladstone. Nothing's changed. Um, and the really big shows are on the East Coast. So if you, if you want to do international competition, right now it's, uh, everything's going to Florida. If you want to really do it, you got to prove yourself in Florida. Um, the advantage the West Coast has, and, it's a, and why so many of the riders on the team are from the West Coast, is our weather. In the West Coast, you can have a nice facility and you can ride. It, maybe there's three days if you don't have a uh, covered arena, maybe there's three days you can't ride in a whole year. Maybe. And maybe not. We don't get much rain. If you have a covered arena, there's no day you can't ride. The weather's always good. The winters are warm and the summers are cool where I live. Right now, today I had to wear a jacket in the morning, you know, and uh, just it's beautiful weather. You don't have to travel. If you live in Florida, you almost have to either have an air-conditioned arena or you have to go north. And if you live north, you have to go down, and it's much harder, and it's much limiting financially than it is on the West Coast. West Coast, you know, you stay at home, ride your horse. It's really easy. Okay, so now let's go back to the quality of the horses, and now I want to ask you about the quality of breeding in the U.S. Do you also agree that that has improved a lot? And... Would you have advised to go to Europe or do you think there are enough good prospects, young prospects in the U.S.? Breeding in the U.S. is incredibly expensive. Um, and the horse market for U.S. horses is low. I'm a breeder. If I have a really nice three or four year old, I'm really lucky to get 30,000. 40,000. I probably have at least 60,000 into the horse. So people buy from Europe. They don't really buy so much from the U.S., which is very disappointing. Um, Lahua Custer right now has some really nice U.S. bred horses, and USDS has a nice scholarship program now for U.S. bred horses that I hope will help. But um, it's hard and expensive to breed horses in the U.S., yeah, I understand that. And what do you think about, is there, are there enough trainers in the U.S. to bring horses from the lower levels to, to the upper classes? Or is it easier to buy them abroad already trained? What's, what are your thoughts about it? On the West Coast, and I'm sure in certain areas on the East Coast, around the D.C. area, um, there are abundance of trainers and excellent trainers. Where the shows are, there's excellent trainers in the West Coast because of the weather. The a lot of areas in the United States, the United States is so large, it's very difficult to have a regular trainer and to bring somebody in. You'd have to bring somebody in for clinics like I did at the beginning in California. But the problem with that, until you have a good trainer, if you get especially to the higher levels, FEI levels, to have your horse straight, to make sure your horse is regular for the Fiat massage, make sure they're carrying the engagement evenly. You really need somebody with excellent eyes almost on a daily basis. And the more you get toward being an international rider, the more you need those excellent eyes on a 
daily basis. Top writers in the world have coaches sitting on the sidelines reading back to them because you need those eyes to really be at the standard of international competition at the Grand Prix level. And um, that's hard. You really, that's, those are the really difficulties you have, especially if you don't live in a very area that's populated with good trainers. Where I live, we have, of course, fantastic trainers. I'm very fortunate. I have a I have couple of questions from our participants now. One says, do you feel like the supply is not meeting the demand when it comes to the U.S.? Or... What, what about time? Sorry? You mean horses? I, what, I don't understand the question. What supply of what? The supply of horses. Like the uh, supply of horses the, or not meeting yeah, the quality. Yeah, no, I understand now. Quality horses are always in demand and they're hard to produce. And I think that's why most people go to Europe because you can get, it's easier to find a quality horse in Europe. Good. And then but I have- it's expensive. I just say it's really expensive to produce a quality horse. I know. You breed a lot of work out. Then I have another question from one of the participants. You, you, you talk about Keen, and then of course you wrote thoroughbreds in the earlier times. There are still thoroughbreds out there. Do you think those thoroughbreds can be competitive at the international level now? Every generation, thoroughbreds are ready to run fast. And you, know, you have a generation every four or five years in a way. And uh, every generation, it's more specifically bred to run fast. I think, you know, a breeder wanted to take thoroughbreds and select for dressage characteristics. It could be done, but it would take generations of horses, where right now with the warm bloods, people have already done that. I think the big thing that's happened in dressage breeding is when the registries finally let us have jumpers for jumpers and dressage horses for dressage horses. And, we're breeding for that. The hunters world now in America is breeding for hunters, but, and so is Europe. But now that we can breed for the uh, sport we're doing, the discipline that we're in and breed for that specific discipline, whether it's a, a roping horse or a cutting horse or a dressage horse, that has really, really, really helped the quality of the sport. Now, my, my my, my next question is regarding the quality of horse rider combinations that the U.S. has been producing lately. And I, before I pose the question, I will tell you a story. Last, last year, I was judging in Germany, actually, and I asked one rider from, it was not a European country, I will not say the name of the country, but then I, I asked, he did quite good in the in the Grand Prix. So I asked him, are you planning to go to the Olympics? And then he said, yes, that's my goal. I need to get higher scores, but I have to wait until the Americas, the Americans go back to the US because now when the Americans are competing here in Europe, the competition has become very difficult. I don't think 30 or 40 years ago, that was the case. So, of course, you can tell that there's a big improvement. Uh, and now the Europeans feel like, okay, the Americans are here, they're doing quite well, and, and you know, good horses, good riders, good quality. So, would you like to comment on that? On the evolution of the quality of training and horse combinations that you're producing now? Well, in the centers that we have, I mean, if you look at the riders in California, our top riders are Gunther Zagal and um, Jan Ebling and um, their European, Stephen Peters, and of course, they're all German. Um, they are German. I mean, they're, yeah. they immigrated. So they got their basics in Germany. In the East Coast, you're seeing wonderful uh, American writers now like Laura Graves and uh, Debbie McDonald and um, 
her student, and they're coming up as American writers. California, we're still mainly the German writers that are the top here. So it's a little different where you go in the country, but the East Coast is bringing up its own writers. And I think that Florida circuit's really, really helping us. Really, really helping us. And we have Adrian Lyle as an example. And it's just like we were talking about breeding yesterday with somebody. And uh, one of our top American breeders, um, Adrian Lyle has bred some of the best foals, has bought, bought some of the best foals that our American breeders have produced. And she's also riding Grand Prix on an American bred horse. And so she's really being a, the, the flag person for American bred horses and really trying to continue to do that. And I, I really respect that. And of course, Laura Grace has an American bred horse. So it's coming up. And I think USDF's program for American bred horses, they give you $25,000 scholarship every year to an American bred horse and their rider just to have them compete. And I think this is really, really helping. Okay, yeah, great. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Now I want to talk a little bit about judging. And uh, I have to say that I have great colleagues in the U.S. And in, in, in my opinion, the system works really well. The education of judges in the U.S. is, is quite good. Uh, do you think that that has also helped the development of the sport? I think our judges prad, uh, programs are humongous. I was in the very first one in the United States. And at the same time, FEI was giving pro judges programs, I was attending judges programs um, uh, that the FEI offered early on. But the, I think what's very important in the United States that helps is to be an S judge, a senior judge in the United States. You have to have scores at Grand Prix. You have to have shown it. And quite a few times. And I think this really helps because it makes the judging more compassionate. It makes the judging more real in that they know what it takes is they have to do it. But they also I find more compassionate in that the judges know what it takes to get to a horse show. You know, um, a lot of judges that haven't shown a lot, they haven't had to load horses, haul horses, travel and compete in strange places, they don't have, they're not as much in touch. I find a lot of the European judges are, but a lot of them that I've judged with just aren't, uh, and American judges, we have old uh, S judges that didn't have to compete at the Grand Prix level. And I think they don't, aren't as in touch with the sport as the judges who have had to compete at the Grand Prix level. I think that's really helped the quality of the American judges, is that requirement. Yeah, that, that's very good. And then going back to the same topic of judges, but in international perspective, do you think the judging has improved over the years worldwide? Uh, or do you still think that we have, and feel free to talk, uh, we still have some deficiencies? Yeah, I, I, I stay in touch with Europe because I always go over to Europe and watch. We couldn't go to Aachen this year, but I almost go to Aachen every year in my life. And so I stay, even though I'm not competing in Europe at the present time, I try to stay really in touch with the judging. And of course, now with the shows, with the scores being out, and also with the uh, audience judging, um, people can participate in the judging, and I think it really helps the judging. I think the judging has gone way up. Judges, however, are under pressure, especially with the overseas judges, knocking down every score that's more than, what, 20% out of line or whatever. Um, they change the score and bring it back up to meet the group. And then they keep track. So if you score and you're a little bit different, let's say you're a judge and you saw the tongue out and you're on the side where you saw the tongue out a lot. And um, the other judges, of course, couldn't see it. And so your score is really, really lower. 
and you know the next day in the press you'll be dis destroyed you know yeah for seeing what was real and there's a lot of pressure on the judges to stay in the middle scores rather than really use the range unless a rider and horse are famous and then if a horse and rider are famous they tend to go to the upper scores because they feel they can and where if a horse isn't famous, they always are worried about maybe they didn't see something I shouldn't see. Horse looks fantastic to me. I call them magical horses. But there's got to be something I didn't see because the horse doesn't have a record. And um, I think this is a little bit, awful lot of pressure on the judges. I always, uh, European judges really aren't paid. And at least in the US, we get paid. But, um, I often wonder how they even find judges because if you're not quite with a group because you see something that you, that's correct, most cases I think, but it's from where you're sitting, those seats are very limiting in what you see. Um, you can give different scores for a very good reason. And of course, next day in the press, you'll just be shredded. I know. And, and so judges. And now with this that's pandemic. Surprising. Yeah, I agree. Now with this pandemic, many people are talking about virtual shows. So I have somebody from the group asking, what, what would you think about virtual shows for now and for the future? You mean where we just uh, video? Yes. The horses? I, I think for fun, they're good. What I'm doing for the pandemic is just running little shows out of my barn. Uh, which are actually mostly for the barn, but I can easily fill 60 spots in the show for a day and just have a recognized judge come in. And they don't count for anything, but my riders are so eager to learn that they're thrilled to be able to ride in the show. Um, I think people can do this at their barns. It doesn't cost much. I, don't, I pay the judge and that's about it. I'm not giving ribbons or trophies or anything. There's no... I charge $50 and that pretty much covers everything, including the drinks that are out there for everybody with the uh, COVID. But um, I do that. I think that's more effective than virtual shows. If you've got people you can get together with and hire a judge. Um, I only will use as judges at this time. And my riders are just thrilled, but virtual, you know, two-dimensional, as much as videos are good, they're very two-dimensional. And you don't really see the whole picture. I mean, I'll go horse shopping and see a horse is incredible on a video and I get there and oh my God, so different. So both ways. I mean, sometimes the horse looks average and he's fantastic and sometimes he looks fantastic and he's average. And I think video's not a pure picture, but it should be nothing. If people can get together and do it, it's fine, but it shouldn't count for anything. You have to see the real animal. And we have to do that. We have to get outside. We have to get out and exercise. And we have to ride and have the real animals. Part of our society, we're all in computers too much. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the, the other part that has changed so much over the year, over the years in the sport of dressage is the organization of dressage shows. Uh, dressage shows have become bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, of course, we have this, you already mentioned the importance of, of Florida and the Florida circuit as one of the biggest in the world. But what are your thoughts about it? That has, has that been good for the U.S. or has that diminished the importance of other CDIs in the U.S.? Because I, I keep on seeing like, a, like the CDIs, are getting smaller or some actually disappearing in other parts of the country and people is just waiting for the Florida season. What do you think about that? Well, in California, we only have a few riders that can go to Florida because we do have CDIs here, but to run a CDI is incredibly expensive. So any show that runs a CDI really has to run another show with it and it has to have a big facility and a lot of upfront money. And otherwise they just, the expense is just ridiculous. And so 
CDIs, FEI charges a lot, our organizations charge a lot. I mean, even now at a local show, if I, I wrote in a show last weekend here in the town I live, I was recognized USEF show and entry for one class is $300. And that was $65 for the class and all the rest was extra fees. They charge you the trailer on, in, they charge you an office fee, they charge you this, they charge you that. And I didn't stable, I trailer in and work out of the trailers. I took 12 horses to that show. And, um, you know, at 300 for your eight minute ride, it's a lot of money for an eight minute ride with a judge. Yeah, it is, it is a lot. And now that we're talking about the difference in shows, what, what would you say is the biggest difference between when you're showing in the U.S. and then you decide to go that extra step and go and compete internationally in Europe? What was the biggest difference for you when you started doing that? Oh, from being a top dog to an underdog? There's a big difference. You know, you, when I was doing that, I haven't shown internationally now for quite a few years. But um, being the top rider in the United States at that time now has changed because American riders are at the top. But and again, the Florida circuit has really helped that. Yeah. So, um, and you can't show internationally in Europe now without the permission of the Federation. And you have to have, the Federation is pretty tight in who they let show in Europe. So... You have to have the permission from our federation to show in Europe which, at the bigger show. Which I think is very important. Actually, in Latin America, we have had that discussion. And some of the writers get mad because they say that we at the federation sometimes are not promoting the sport. If we are requesting them to get good scores in national classes in the U.S. before they registered in a CDI or the same for the ones that are in Europe. And we, the federations, have been highly criticized about it, but I think it's very important because it's the name of oh, the country. I totally agree with you. You don't go in an international show. If any of, no other sport would be allowed in an international competition without having high qualifying criteria. Otherwise, yeah. it's not international. And there's many, many levels, you know, and you can have your, your virtual dressage at one level, which it certainly beats no, no scoring, beats nothing. And you can have your international competition at the, inter, at the CDIs that it's very much at the highest level, at the Aachen and the Olympics. And, it's it's very different competition and the criteria should be strict and it is you don't want to yeah. sit in that rack watch in especially world equestrian games i think there's still too much range in the world equestrian games i think they should up that criteria a little bit i was watching a lot of bad rides at the last world equestrian games that maybe the quality could have been better overall so a lot of days of dressage is not such big riding so yeah, maybe that's standard. That's the, always the big fight that the FEI has with the International Olympic Committee. And that is, we need to see more flags. And of course, with yeah. the enthusiasts of dressage, we say, we want to see more quality. So that's, mm -hmm. that's not always easy to, to reach to an agreement. Well, and I think that's where the FEI can certainly do something in trying, and they do, they have in the past, send people around to try to improve the quality of some of the countries that have less uh, access to quality trainers. And I know the FEI does do that. I did in the past, and it needs to be done. Hilda, and I, and I want to ask you a question that for us, for the Latin Americans, is very important. You you lived through the time and you competed through the time where America or the 
The sport of dressage in America was just beginning and you competed from the lower levels up to Grand Prix. And now we have the discussion of the Pan American Games, which in the 80s were at the Grand Prix level. And I have to tell you a story in the middle of this. Uh, I want, one of my dreams was to go to the, to the Pan Am Games, where I had seen you competing. And then one day I said, I need a horse that can make it to the Grand Prix level. After I got that horse, thanks God my father bought one very good horse for me. Then the Pan Am Games went down to the St. George level and have stayed there since. And now there are all these arguments because many countries in Central and South America said, if you move towards the Grand Prix level, we will not be able to compete. So the Pan American Games will only be for Canada, the US, probably Mexico and Brazil. And then the, pa the Pan Am Games will be gone. There are some others like me that said, that are saying we have to promote the sport, we have to raise the level of horses and especially the level of trainers so that we can make teams that can go and compete. But I, I would like to hear your opinion or your recommendations, what these countries should do to be able to raise the level from you know, having three riders that can do St. George level to having three riders that can do a Grand Prix level and then half Grand Prix at the Pan Am Games? Well, I think one, the, um, I, I know quite a few, I did a, a clinic in Honduras and I know they're working very hard there to try to get to the Grand Prix level. And um, I know for sure Colombia has some very, very good riders because I judge the show there. In Bogota. I was very, very impressed with the quality. You know, it's, people just have to want, I think if you make it Grand Prix, I think you'll have them on the Grand Prix horses. I really do. I and mean, if they can ride a good pre-St. George, they can ride a Grand Prix horse. And maybe there's a lot of older Grand Prix horses. They don't, they're not so expensive and they can get these horses and get to the Grand Prix level because the Piaf and Passage is a whole world of its own. And, you know, it's 40% of the Grand Prix test. And um, we're breeding horses now that almost Piaf and Passage when they can step out of the mother's womb. Yes. That's... So it's much easier to find horses that can Piaf Passage. I mean, I'm always amazed with the young horses we have now that, you know, we start them in half steps at four and, huh? oh, <laughs> yeah. Nice Piaf. And um, some of them, they just passage. You have to work on the trot because they want to passage. And these horses are out there now. And if you want to do international competition, any country can breed a horse with frozen semen. You can get really good breeding. That's how the standard of horses in our country has gone up. I'm on my fourth generation of mares with frozen semen. And my mares are pretty fancy. And um, I breed the pretty fancy stallions. And the stallions actually are here locally. And um, we have some wonderful stallions in California. You don't, and they're, they're most of those are bred in Germany, but not all. Some are in Holland, of course, and some in Denmark, but some really, 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 really nice stallions for dressage. Okay. Hilda, we also have some uh, upcoming trainers or young persons that want to dedicate, dedicate their lives to the sport of dressage. And you're a wonderful example of, of having, do, do, having done that successfully. What would your recommendations for them be? What would you recommend them for a career? Well, I would, and I mean, it's a lot because I have, uh, students i have young people working for me as and they groom but i let them have riding opportunities and i often can sell them a horse that maybe doesn't vet too well or 
maybe it's a little hot and they're good with hot horses it's very very reasonably and let them work off their board and so i'm always bringing riders up this way but that's the hard way to do it what i would recommend for most people is to get an education get a decent job and then be able to afford to really learn the sport as an amateur first and have the good horses i have a couple doctors that ride with me and they're they spent years getting their education so they could have horses and as a doctor they can afford to have nice horses and other people in other fields the same but I see too many people that are dead ended when they are grooms and they never get to ride enough. Because to be a really good rider, when I, I always owned, owned my own horse, like I bought my own horse when I was 14. And um, then through college, I trained horses for board. I was riding at least day to day all the way through college. And um, right now I'm still riding, oh, at least 12 a day more days more, I do 15 than 12. Okay. I love to ride, riding's my passion. But I taught school for 14 years. I got an education, I taught school and I could afford to have my horse and go to the Olympics and things. And uh, I think it's a really good idea to have most riders, most people, if they don't have any financial backing to try to get an education, to try to get a job skill and try to have a job that can let you afford a horse or two. I think that's and then a, if you make it, you can be a professional, but it's, being a professional is tough. You have to show you're really good before you can make any money as a professional. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's, that's a wonderful way of putting it. And I would add, even if you have the financial means, just going through college, it, it helps you with your brain and the way, you know, a good way of thinking, planning, and so forth. So I think that, that that was a wonderful advice for 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 the young people that we have in our uh, in our in our talk today. So we have now a, one question that says, "What are your tips to train a young horse in general? What would your focus for training a young horse would be?" Inside leg to outside rein, stretching them down, getting them over their backs, getting to ride them from back to front, being kind, being fair, being logical. I love training young horses. And, uh, but you have to develop their trust and their fairness. And if you really want a horse to be successful for you, they have to really like you. They like to like the work relationship with you. I always try to keep my works pretty short. I try to keep my horses going to the stable really happy. And I like them to enjoy the riding sessions. And I have some wonderful horses, two at Grand Prix that are wonderful. And just wonderful young horses are 10 now, both lovely Grand Prix horses. I just sit on them and they hand me the Grand Prix the joy of my day every day and then I'm bringing up a whole bunch of others. Some are just horses that ride for other people and train them for other people, but I have four I ride of my own every day. A four-year-old, a five-year-old, the two ten-year-olds that are Grand Prix. I just have a blast. But I'm a rider. I've always been a rider. Hilda, what, I are, love the relationship. what are your thoughts about draw reins? You know, some people hate them, some people love them, some people think that it depends whether or not you can handle them. What do you think about draw reins? Um, I think draw reins, like right now, the 15 horses I have in training, I don't use draw reins and have it on any of them. But certainly in my past, if I get a horse that's totally inverted, and a jumper or something like this, or just a horse that's been ridden by a horrible rider with horrible hands, and it's inverted and backless. The draw reins can help teach the horse to stretch. And I use draw reins for that purpose only. I use draw reins to teach horses to stretch down. I do not draw, use draw reins to put a horse in the pit. If you teach a horse to stretch down properly and to bend and supple properly inside leg to outside rein, 
and start using its back. You don't need draw reins to put them on the bit. They'll come on the bit. And could they stretch dressage horses? Hillary Clayton from um, Michigan State gave a wonderful lecture. And in dressage, we put our horses on the bit differently than other sports. We stretch our horses to the bit. And dressage horses break at the second vertebra. Western horses generally break the pole at the third. Uh, saddlebreds, jumpers often at the first. But we stretch our horses to the bit. And we're the only sport that really does it that way. And we have them sex at the second vertebra. And then we collect them by moving them to the wanting desire to stretch to the bit and engaging their haunches. And you can actually still find this if you go to the old books, like with Vladimir Sunik. He was my book, Growing, Growing Up. The only thing is, with his wonderful Vladimir book, I never understood a word of it until I could do it. And then I go, oh yeah, that's what he was saying. It's just like inside leg, outside rain. Until you have a horse from your inside leg, stretch his spine around your inside leg and fill out the outside rein. You don't know what it's about. But once you feel that, you realize it has to always be, even if the horse is straight, you always know which is your inside and which is your outside. And the horse does too, because the reins have different functions, but only if the horse is correctly on them. And there's so much to dressage, it's just amazing. I teach a lot. And, um, and the, it's just the detail to be a really good rider in dressage is unbelievable. And the mechanics of the horse and how to improve these mechanics so the horse can do the sport the way it should be done. And there's very little force involved. It's a lot of really, really good suppling and educating and riding of the horse. And it's life challenge. It's the challenge of my life. Every day, every horse I get on, I try to ride the best I can. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. Now that you're talking about the rider, I was reading something that you said that impressed me because it happens to me as well. And you were saying in an article, I think it was Versace Today or something like that, where you said, nothing that upsets more a judge than a bouncing seat. Uh, you know, when That's you true. that the that that the poor horse is not being able to perform not because of him but because of the rider so and this will be my last question what would your recommendations be for the riders that are still bouncing and want to get a better seat a more stable seat the way to Get rid of a bouncing seat. And I, as I say, I start a lot of riders. And lunging, it's good if you have a horse sound enough to lunge. I don't have a horse right now. Most of my, my school horses are in their 20s. They even have one fabulous 131. And they're not being lunged for riders. But what I have my riders do, and it's very successful, is trot as slow as they have to to keep from bouncing. And if they need to hold on to a strap or the pummel, that's fine. But really learn to flex your hips. And I teach them how to flex your hips from the ground. Um, if you just have them practice pushing a book against the kitchen counter and using those muscles, flexing those muscles in their core and in their hips, it will help them learn to sit the trot. Uh, with all the Michael Jackson videos, you know, he'd have no problem sitting a trot and using the hips that way. And, um, just don't bounce. It just if you have to trot slow for six months, and the cat, of course, is easier to sit. So most riders can figure that one out because they do enough without stirrups. And they have to have a suitable horse that can do this. But you, if you bounce, you'll never learn to sit. You have to trot, make the trot or the gates to get a suitable horse that you can, school horse, and learn how to use your body in a way that you can sit. And once you figure it out. It's not that hard. It's a very natural movement for everyone. But you just can't keep bouncing. You gotta let yourself sit. Okay, Hilda, thank you very much. I, I think this was a wonderful conversation. Is there anything in particular you would like to add tonight? 
or do we have any more questions from our audience? I'm not getting any more questions, but is there anything you want to talk about, Hilda? Uh, no, just that I'm thrilled that people are interested in dressage enough to participate and that you take your time to do it for us. And uh, my mind's honored when I get to judge with you. And um, thank you for inviting me. And I hope everyone enjoys riding their horse tonight. Thank you very much. I hope I can see you soon. I'm, I'm supposed to judge in, in California, CDI in November. So if I have time, I will go visit you. Uh, it's well, you always can't, a pleasure. I plan to ride in it, so you have to keep your distance. Oh, okay. I I, you, those I have you were planning and participating. In it. So Great. I will see you at So that's wonderful. Thanks for accepting these invitations and thanks everybody for accepting and for being here today.